Converge family. I don't want to make a podcast for a uh, virtual service or maybe you're streaming on the app any longer than it already is. I just want to pop in really quick on the front and then also again on the back. On the front side, I just want to welcome you. Thank you for being a part of our Converge family, for joining us here with us. We consider this to be a part of our community and we care a lot about making sure you have this every single week. And so thank you for joining us. And secondly, maybe it's an encouragement, maybe it's even a challenge, but but can I just say that consider not making this the only part of your spiritual discipline as far as your journey of faith with us or with anywhere for that matter. While I, I hope this is an amazing supplement to what God is doing with you plugged into a church, maybe a temporary substitute while you're out or on vacation or just have a need to unplug for a little bit, that's all wonderful. But as an ongoing substitute, this will fall short of, I think, what God designed for his church to, to do life with, to worship with, to do small groups with, to serve together. And so let me just encourage you, while I hope this blesses you, inspires you, encourages you, challenges you today, that the message we share virtually will never be a good enough substitute for who the church is when we are his hands and his feet together. So enjoy this, but consider joining us at one of our locations in one of our service times. You can find out more information on our app. You can search it in any app store. Just look up Converge Sacramento, or you can find us online at www.thisisconverge.com. And we would love to see you in person. I love you, fam. I hope you enjoy the message. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. Lots going on this morning, if you can't tell. One of the things you might be asking yourself as we get started is, uh, there's just somebody that I haven't seen yet this morning. Uh, Pastor Dustin, he and Jess are off there in Ohio uh, for the weekend. They're dealing with some family issues, and uh, they just are be blessed to be able to be there. Um, and they'll, they'll be back this, this coming week. So um, we are here, and they are there, and we are praying for them, and they are praying for us. So that's all good. And uh, they are here in spirit for sure. I've got two daughters. Uh, they're, they're older, young adults. And uh, my youngest daughter, Kelsey, uh, she, she's, she's a delight. She is, that, now let, let me set this up a little bit. My oldest daughter, her name is Laura, and uh, she and I are two peas in a pod. So when it comes to understanding her, it was really easy for me. Like, like I know what she's thinking before she is kind of a relationship with her. I mean, do you have a, a child like that? You know, you parents where it's like, I, I, they are so like me. I know what they're like, you know, and it's easy sometimes to deal with them, with their attitudes, with their disappointments, with whatever's going on, because you know how you feel and it's easy to relate to them. That's Laura, my oldest, my youngest, Kelsey, <laughs> not so much. <laughs> I, I don't get her at all. <laughs> she is not like me in any way, shape, or sort. She may have some of my DNA, but in personality, no. <laughs> there is nothing like her. And uh, my daughter, uh, she was very concerned about fairness. That's not even a thing that I really think of a lot. But for her, when she was growing up, especially in those like junior high, middle school, junior high years, that was a big deal fairness. And man, I cannot tell you how many times I heard Kelsey say these three words. Are you ready? You know what they are. That's not fair. <laughs> My standard response, of course, was yes. <laughs> That's exactly right. Life's not fair. Sorry, kiddo. Life's not fair. You you know what? Didn't work all the time. In fact, it hardly ever worked. But that was my response. Um, it happened a lot when she felt like we would make a promise that somehow we couldn't keep, like going to get a treat after school, or maybe uh, buying her something, like in our in our skit this morning, like promising that we would do this to get her something that she really wanted, and maybe it was going to have to be postponed for one reason or another. Or maybe it was like going to see a movie or going to hang out with some friends later and plans would have to change. And, and so she would say those words, that's not fair. Well, I, you know, life's not fair. <laughs> and sometimes we have to deal with that. But I think 
in reflection when it comes to what she felt was a promise. Uh, she may have had a point to a degree. Um, when, when plans change, when something came up that caused those plans to change, wh why? Be because what happens is she hears what she thinks is a promise, and then based on that promise, she gets her hopes up, and then those hopes create expectations. So that the way that works, right? We get the promise that raises our hopes, and that creates expectations. And that's what would happen with her. Why is that such a big deal? Why would she get so emotional? Because hope is powerful. Hope lifts our hearts. Hope gives us something to aim for. Hope gives us purpose. Hope makes us resilient. Hope is powerful. And I want to talk about that some this morning. Hope, because hope makes all the difference sometimes in our life. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for the hope you bring. <laughs> we praise you for the hope in our life. We God, want to feel hope in this room, in your presence. And so help us to enter into this concept, this idea, as, as, as we just have this conversation this morning about hope. May hope be birthed for those who need it. May hope come alive for those where it needs quickened. May hope grow in those where it is small this morning. May hope help those of us who need resiliency. God, hope. So fill us with your hope today, we pray. Amen. So my daughter instinctively knew what I am trying to tell you, what I want to talk to you about, that we can hope because people make promises. We can hope because people make promises. That's the way it works. The hope um, only has a substance, actually, it's really nothing. Hope only has substance when it is grounded in a promise. And then that promise can actually be fulfilled by others. So like if I told you this morning that uh, I hope to win a million dollars. Now I could say that. And you all would know what I mean. You know, hey, that would be nice. Would love that, right? Who wouldn't? Um, I would hope that I could win a million dollars, but... Here's the deal. I've never bought a lottery ticket in my life, ever. So I don't know what that hope would be based on if I don't do anything. I've never filled out a publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes entry form or whatever that is. I, I, I'm just saying words here. I don't even know what that is. Never even seen one. I don't know. I, I've never done anything that would ever help me win a million bucks in any way. I don't go to... Las Vegas. It's just not what I do. It's not my thing. And so I'm not sure how I would win a million bucks. I, mean, I hope someday I'd win, win a million bucks. But I've done nothing that would ever give me even an inkling of a promise or even a commitment that maybe there's a shot in the dark, a chance that I could win a million bucks, win a buck for that matter. I mean, I'm not going to win anything in my life, not money. Because, <laughs> you know, because I don't do anything with it. That's the deal. I've got to fill that stuff out. That's not reality. But I can hope in some real stuff. Like I can hope for money to hit my checking account twice a month. My employer makes a promise of a paycheck if I work at my job. Is that a good hope? Oh, I'm hoping that somebody that works with me is raving their hand and going, yes, that's a good hope. <laughs> I'm getting nervous. <laughs> I hope for people who love me and to show me love when I gather with my converged family on Sunday morning. I, I, I hope that for you. <laughs> when you walk in this door, I hope that you feel greeted, that somebody has given you love, that somebody has said, I'm glad you're here. You're a part of something special. You're a part of a family. You're a part of some, something that's happening today that can change your life. <laughs> I hope for that. I want that. I hope to spend quality time with my daughters in January. I'm actually, they both live in New Jersey and those stinkers moved all the way back across the country. Makes it difficult, but in January, I'm hoping to get a couple of days to go back and visit them. I've got permission for time off. I've talked to them. Their schedules are good. Promises have been made. The airlines promised to fly me there. I hope for a good visit with them, right? We hope for real things. I can hope for these things because promises or commitments were made. That's the deal, right? Hope are based 
on promises that can be committed or fulfilled. Otherwise, it's just a, just a wish. It's a thought. It's a dream. It's not, it's not hope. In the same way, guys, we can hang on to what we, I'm going to call big hope, like life-altering hope, transitional hope, serious hope, because of the promises that God makes in the world and to us. That matters in my life, especially when I'm feeling hopeless or discouraged or despairing or despondent, when I feel like everything is collapsed or crashed and I need something to hang on to. That something to hang on to is hope. And the hope that I have for that big hope is the hope that I have because of God's promises to us, to me, to you. And I want us to leave today knowing that those promises are there, that they're real. And when I can believe them for my own, then that hope springs in me. And God begins to see faith and faith begins to move mountains and things begin to happen in our lives. That's good stuff. So that's how hope works. Hope, big hope. God's promise. So there's this guy, there's this Canadian school teacher, way too much time on his hands. And after the reading, he, for a year and a half, this guy reads through the Bible 25 times. Nothing better to do. I mean, I don't know what else he's doing. 25 times through the whole Bible in a year and a half. And he claims that there's over 7,500 promises made by God to humanity. Now, I put those all in a book, but they already exist in a book. I'll give that one a second to think, sink in here. Right? So we have, we have the Bible, and that, there's a lot of promises. God makes a lot of promises to us in Scripture. For example, and he does that. Why does he do that? Why, why so many promises? Why from cover to cover of this amazing book that guides our lives? Why, why is that? This thing that tells me about my relationship with, with, with the world, with people, with him. And his relationship to me, all of these promises are in the scripture. And, and he does this because it reflects his desire for relationship. Right? I give promises to my daughters because I love them. <laughs> I want to see them have an amazing life. We give promises to each other because we care about each other or we want something. God wants something with us too. God wants a relationship. So God promises things. In a relationship with me, God says, there's a lot of great stuff that I commit to. And you can build your hope on that. Because that's who God is. Man, I don't think you caught that this morning. <laughs> because of a relationship that God, the creator of the universe, wants to have with us. He promises us stuff so that we may rely on him. So that that relationship benefits the two of us. He does it and gives us promises to reflect his love. He does it and gives us promises to reflect his grace. He does it to reflect his presence and activity in our lives. And God never breaks his promises. I might tell God sometimes that's not fair. <clears throat> and I might hear back from God in prayer, yeah, and life isn't fair. Because sometimes we're going to go through tough stuff. But in the same breath, God says, I will give you hope through my promises <laughs> so that when you're going through stuff, you can trust faith and hope together. You can trust that I've got you in the middle of whatever you're walking through, good or bad, blessing or hardship. Isn't that great? That God would so be concerned about us to give us promises of hope. That changes everything. I'm not alone through life. I'm not, I'm not just walking through or cruising through life just hoping to stay out of and avoid all the bad stuff. I can take risks and I can live life knowing, believing, hoping for what all that God says is true, is true. So let's do that together. When even, even God at the beginning knew that, that, that we would really mess things up, that we would struggle in life, that with Adam and Eve, we would, that, that things would break. You know, three big things broke. Our relationships with each other broke as Adam and Eve sinned and sin enters the world. And our relationship with God broke and our relationship with creation broke. 
And in the middle of all the brokenness caused by sin, God says, I'm going to help put things right. Hope. That's this hope that we saw in the video, that this hope that we heard about in this skit. In fact, God says, I'm going to make you a promise that I'm going to help take care of it in person. I'm going to be personally accountable to creation. I'm going to make promises to my creation so that they can hope <clears throat> that I will come and help put things right and help with all the brokenness. Hope. <clears throat> so he promised. He promised to come in person, in the flesh. He promised to come to rescue from sin and death. He promised to come and restore, <clears throat> excuse me, what was broken. He promised to give life and peace and guidance and forgiveness and mercy and grace and hope. God's hope first came in the world actually when he, before sin ever entered the world. When he told Adam, uh, when he said to himself, let us make man in our own image in Genesis 1.26. Hope springs out of the promise of relationship. Let us make man in our image. Why? So that we can have a relationship together so that love can be shared. And there is hope there because of a promise of relationship. So there's hope. He didn't just say, well, let me make, let me make humanity and let's, let's let the world be populated with people who can have a relationship with me. And yeah, we'll just, we'll just see, you know, I'll just set it in motion and, and uh, good luck to all y'all. And, and, you know, I'll just stand back and watch what happens. God's like, no, no, no. I'm going to be intimately involved, not just with humanity as a whole, but each of you as a person <laughs> throughout all of time. So for you, Nick, or Coral, or for others of you, God's like, I am right here. And because of this relationship idea from creation in the beginning, you can hope, set your hopes on him that whatever it is that you need, he has got. And then we walk and step into that. Knowing things would have to be fixed and how broken things were, then God makes another promise, another big promise to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, he says these words to Abraham before Abraham even took a step in the right direction, before Abraham even followed obediently of where God wanted him to, before Abraham even started his journey of faith, God said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families, here it is, of the promise, all the families on earth for all time in every nation in every city in every place would be blessed through you he's talking about the hope of jesus coming through the line of abraham to bless the world the promise continues through david god promised david in 2 Samuel 7, 12 to 13 at the end of his life he says when your days are over david and you rest with your ancestors I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. That's Sol uh, Solomon. And then I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Who comes through the line of David? Jesus. And his lordship and kingship is established forever. Hope continues. God promised through all the prophets. We saw that in the video. Therefore, in Isaiah 7, 14, it says this, the Lord himself will give us a sign. A sign of what? A sign for hope. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel. Hope. Jesus is gonna come. And all the prophets point to this moment of hope. This moment of hope that's gonna hit the world and change it forever. So now we have hope <laughs> and we have hope today. <laughs> and when we get to live in that hope and we get to stand on those promises and today it's even better in person because God has come in person because God put flesh on because God now has a face. We may have not seen the face of Jesus, but we know there was one. And, and for me to know that my hope can be rested in a God who says, I will love so much that not only will I make promises to get things fixed and the brokenness of the world fixed, which includes, by the way, all of the broken relationships we have, you and me, 
all of the brokenness that we, we have around us with stuff and things and the world and resources, the, 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 the things that seem globally are, 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 are headed to hell in a handbasket, all of that stuff. We have hope in this real person, Jesus, God who came as a, this little baby, this thing that we celebrate for Christmas, this one that we celebrate, hope. And he comes, and he comes in person, and he comes to be present, because like we saw in this skit, sometimes the only way to see hope fulfilled is when somebody comes and does it personally. And that's what God says, I will do. Through all the prophecies, I'm going to come in person. And to us today, he's like, I came in person, came to be you, so that you can have real hope. I fulfilled all those Old Testament promises to Abraham, to David, to the prophets. And now I continue to be here so that the promise of God are true and yea and amen in the world. In other words, they will come to pass in our lives. Maybe not all of them in our lifetime, but certainly in our lives. And so we hope. Do you need hope today? Am I making the case for Jesus for hope? I hope so. I hope so. Jesus is so amazing. And I say that because I know the spirit of God who is at work to touch our lives. And when we walk out of here, we can look at each other and go, man, some stuff is tough right now, but God's got this. And my hope it's real. And my hope it's true. And my hope it's sure. Our hope today can be even more solid than it was back in the old Testament days when they had all the prophets, but they were still looking for the Messiah. The writer of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews, has this one verse. Uh, he, he writes a lot about who Jesus was and what Jesus came to do and who Jesus is. And so he writes this, this one sentence in here that, that we can hang on to. It really helps us today as we talk about promises and hope. And it says this. He says in Hebrews 8, chap, uh, chapter 8, verse 6. But now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood. In other words, the old things before Jesus. For he is now the one who mediates for us a far better covenant or promise of life with God. Based on better promises. Better promises, better hope. You see it? And so the hope that you and I can walk with and live with today can be amazing and strong and powerful. I want to just take a look at just a fraction. We are not going to go through 7,500 promises today. I, pr I promise, okay? We're not doing that. But I want to go through some big ones. I want to go through some of these promises of God that we can stand on today, that you can stand on today. The first is God's promises to answer prayer. Do sometimes you feel like I do? Sometimes I feel like I start to try to talk to God and, and it's like, it's rough, man. It's like, is he listening? Is he there? Does he hear me? Am I talking to air? Is, you know, they call this, this idea sometimes like the heavens are brass that I can't break through. I can't get through. Where is God? But God promises, no matter how I feel, that he hears prayers. And he answers. Now, we, I may not might like his answer, but God says, I'm going to answer prayer. I am there for you. He says in Isaiah 65, 24, and I know that these aren't all up there, but the reference is if you want to, if that's important for you this morning, you can make a note of that. He says, I will answer them. These people that call on me, these people that ask for help, these people that turn to me and say, I need, I need something from you today, Jesus. Or I just want to praise you and glorify you and tell you I love you, Jesus. As we pray to him, he says, I will answer them before they even call to me. He knows. Can I hope with that? Oh, yeah. While they are still talking about their needs, he says, I will go ahead and answer their prayers. Isaiah 65, 24. So we hope as we pray, and we pray as we hope. So I talk to Jesus. It doesn't have to be flowery, right? Prayer doesn't have to be a big thing. So I talk to Jesus. I, I am hoping, Jesus, because you're working the world, and I know you love me, and you're working my life, and you see what's going on. <laughs> and so I need my hope that as I walk this through, or as I journey through whatever it is that I'm in the middle of, that Jesus, you 
have my back. You have me. And you may not change my circumstances, but you'll change me in the middle of them. And I will be different. Let me tell you, sometimes that's just the way it goes. But my hope then is not a selfish hope other than I want to grow. I want to be different. So in the middle of whatever we walk through, I know that that hope will come through and come through. Jesus wants to be there to give victory. He wants to be there to answer prayer. He, he may say, you know what? Th this is the answer that's going to go this way. So let you and I work out how that's going to affect you and work in your life. And, and I may have to grow a little bit spiritually. I, I may have to walk through a little bit of spiritual discipline. I may have to have one of you come along beside and say, yeah, Ed, you got this. Come on, we got this together. And, and we're going to walk this through and we're going to be okay on the other side of this thing. But I don't go in with despair and darkness. I don't go in at the bottom. I go in with hope. I can see light. I know there's an end to the tunnel. I know there's another side to the chasm that faces me. Hope. God promises to provide wisdom. James 1.5, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. That's a promise. He will not rebuke you for asking so we hope as we make decisions and trust God to lead us well. God promises to give purpose to our lives. John 10.10, 10, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. And my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. So we hope for a life that is better with God than without him. And I will tell you, that is a promise that is absolutely true. And you can bank and hope for that. A life with God is going to be far better because we're going to go through stuff in this life with or without God. <laughs> and I'm going to choose to do it with him. Because I then have hope because of the promises he makes me. Another promise. God promises nothing is going to separate me from his love. That's not true of people here. <laughs> but it is true of God. He says in Romans 8, 38 and 39, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries or anxiousness about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all of creation, there's no power, no spirit, no anything on this world that is going to be more than what God is in his love constantly poured out to me. He says, indeed, nothing in creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that's revealed in Christ. So we hope that we will never be abandoned and we can stand on that promise. Because sometimes you feel lonely. And that happens. And sometimes I can feel lonely, and, but, but, but I know I'm never alone. See the difference? And I'm never alone because I have hope. <laughs> and I look to God and I say, all right, let's, let's keep walking, Jesus. Even when I don't feel you, he's not, he's not left me. Another one, God promises to help with temptation. Oh, that might have caught your attention. <laughs> if you've been sleeping. Yeah, God promises to help with temptation. I should have everybody's attention by this point. You're all like, okay, yeah, okay, how's that work? First Corinthians 10, 13. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow those temptations to be more than what you can deal with or stand. And when you are tempted, he will show you a way out if you choose so that you can endure. So we hope that much of what we might be entangled with, we can avoid. Doesn't mean I'm going to be perfect. Doesn't mean I'm going to live a sinless life. <laughs> no, only one did that, Jesus. But maybe... Some of the sin that might entangle me, I can avoid and follow Christ differently than just be a slave to it and just do it all the time, habitually. Does that make sense? That's what that's for. God promises to forgive our sin. Man, that's good news this morning, isn't it? 1 John 1, 9, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all wickedness. So we hope that even when we give in to temptation... God forgives. God is generous and grace restores. All right. God promises to provide for our needs. Matthew 7, 7 to 8. 
It says this, keep on asking and you're going to receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, you're going to find. Keep on knocking and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and everyone who knocks, the door will be open. We hope that we will have enough so that we might be generous. Remember, we talked about that a couple weeks ago, that generosity. So I hope for enough. I hope for a family that we give enough so that maybe even with what they receive, they can be generous. Wouldn't that be an amazing story of Christmas? Huh? A couple more. God promises joy. Psalm 1611. He will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of his presence and the pleasures of living with him forever. So we hope that even the greatest pain doesn't lead to despair. God promises to make us like Jesus, Romans 8, 29. For God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son so that when his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And so I have the hope that I don't stay this, this, this broken, <laughs> sin slave kind of guy. This person who just walks through the world and says, well, that, you know, that's just what it is, you know, that, can't change. There's nothing about it. I'm just going to whatever, and I'll just go through and, and my life and, and just, uh, you know, it is what it is. No, 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 no. I go through saying, Jesus, I know there's a hope that I don't have to stay this broken, hurting, painful guy. I, I can have a, a life because of you, an abundant life because of you, a, a, a real life, an eternal life, uh, a redeemed life, a rescued life, a restored life. All the ravages and pain of brokenness and sin of my life can be redeemed, can be uh, uh, switched, changed, used for good in the world because of the hope and promises that I feel in this world. That's the life I want. That's the life I want. That's the life Jesus offers. That's the life God has for us. If we say, yeah, if we say, yeah, see, there's the deal. We, we get the concept. <laughs> we get the idea. God makes promises. I can hope. So now I can trust. And my life can be different. And that is God's side of the bargain. In other words, God's made promises that we can hope in but I've got to choose to do my work so that hope comes alive in me. I've got to be able to sit here this morning and, and say, okay, I, I, I hear God's promises and, and, and pick up those books if I need to know more of what those promises really are in the world or, or get into my Bible and start looking at that. What are, those, what are those promises that I can really stand on, especially if I'm really going through something right now? I got to be able to hang on and stand on and cling on to something and that is hope. So what do I do? I find those promises and I, I take them to God. I say, God, I see that you promised this. And so here's what's going on in my life. And so I'm standing in this and I'm hoping for this. So God, I'm going to trust you that you're going to do your work and have your way in me in this situation. But that means I've got my work to do. Like, like I have to know his promises. <laughs> I can't really develop a lot of hope if I don't know what he promises. If you never make a promise, then nobody has to hope in you. But God's made so many of them. And if I don't get to know them, so part of my work to do as a follower of Jesus this morning is to figure out what are those promises for me? Where, where are those things that Jesus is, that God has given in his word that I can stand on and build my hope around? And so, so I want to encourage you this morning to check those out. <laughs> Get those books, open up scripture, do the things that will help you find out what those promises are that you and I can stand on this morning and then embrace them as mine, as yours. See, sometimes we tend to read the Old Testament prophecies and hear stories of this in Christmas and go, oh, that was sweet. That's nice. Those wonderful prophets. And they all told about Jesus coming as a little baby and it's cute and it's adorable. And we have a manger scene at home. You have a manger scene, right? That we all set up at the house. And, and, and that's all warm and fuzzy feeling, you know? And then as I go through my crisis, the baby drops and I, you know, I feel like I'm all alone. And, and somehow I've got to make it personal, <laughs> 
like, it's not just this fun story. It's life. It's God's reality with me. And so Jesus, you go from being here to being here so that I can walk that through with you. And so now that hope springs in me because, because the story of Christmas and the story of the Old Testament prophet's hope becomes so real in me now that Jesus is in me and not just to come. Now he will come again. And that's a part of a hope that we do have as humanity. But I get to have something that the Old Testament prophets never had as they wrote about hope in Jesus. I have that hope inside of me today because I have a relationship with him. That simple Jesus, I need you and what a relationship with you, forgive me. That's it. That's simple. Those simple words. Finds that relational hope in me. Not make me perfect. Not take away all my problems. <laughs> not make everything, you know, just the way I want my life to be lived. But now, Jesus, how do you want that for me? So I have to embrace that. I have to, and, and, and I have to embrace the stipulations. Uh, you've heard Dustin say before, many of God's promises have provisions. A lot of times, some of those promises are conditioned on my work on my entering in, on my believing, on my, sometimes my even repenting. I might have to go and say, you know what, Jesus, I, I've kind of been just doing my own selfish thing. So I repent of that. <laughs> and as hard as that is, and as tough as that is sometimes for us to do, so that Jesus, you, you can do the rework. And, and, and I like to use the way I've been using the word lately, rewiring in me. That's what transformation does. It rewires us, rewire me to be different. <laughs> so I have my work, that conditional provisional stuff, and it's not much. Usually it's just looking to him and saying, okay, I, I embrace it and I trust you. So now what would you have me do? And the hope changes. Sometimes that hope of that renewed relationship, for example, is predicated on me humbling myself enough to start the conversation and not waiting for the other person, for example. So I, I have a hope of maybe restoring a relationship with somebody that's broken and I can just sit around the house and hope all day <laughs> until I say, Jesus, how does that hope change my heart so that now I can go to them humbly and go, I, I got to apologize for my part in this. I, I can't do anything about their part and I won't say that they know but I can certainly do my work. Hope. When I come alongside Jesus with the things that I can do with my hope, things begin to happen. Mountains begin to move. Relationships begin to heal. Stuff gets restored. Things begin to return. Stuff begins to happen spiritually and practically. Who wants that for this Christmas? I do. There are some things still in my life that I am holding on to hope for this Christmas. There are things in my life I am holding on to Jesus for this Christmas. I'm like, come, come, come. So I will trust you. I will trust you, Ben, if you would come. We need hope. We need hope. We need desperately need hope this morning. I've said it a couple of times already this morning because without hope, we despair. Without hope comes depression. Without hope comes despondency. Without hope, I, I begin to just sit and wither. It's just the, the feeling of just ho hopelessness is horribly miserable if you've been there before. And man, I want you to walk away this morning with the hope of Jesus in you. I want you to walk away having with God gone, even as, as, as Nick and the worship band leads us in this final song with hope, that you're able to look to Jesus today and, and get some things resolved as we finish up this morning and say, yes, I am going to look to you. I'm going to figure out what promise you're making to my life in this moment and applies to me and I'm going to hold on to it and I'm going to hope and I'm going to let you do in my life and with me what you would so that I can see hope realized and come alive this Christmas season. I so want that for you. It would be so much fun after the first of the year to start hearing stories of hope fulfilled. Wouldn't that be great? A realized hope in your lives. What is Jesus doing for you? What hope is he not just birthing in you, but fulfilling in you this Christmas? Some of you, it may not happen until next Christmas <laughs> or the Christmas after because it's just that big. 
There are things I've talked about, my brokenness. Do you know why I decorated for Christmas this weekend? Because last year I did nothing. Because I just it was I was not in a good place. It was okay, but it's, hope has done something in me this last year. And so it's like now I, it shows even through simple things like decorating my house to remember the birth of Christ. Because hope. And it was big stuff, so it took a while. I talked last week about the job, and I have hope that I didn't have a month ago even because of that. I have hope. And the same God that does that work in me this last year is doing that work in you right now. And I want you to hold on to that and grab it with both hands and everything you've got inside you and say, I am not going to let go of hope. I'm going to let this thing guide my life. I'm going to let God do something with me through this thing and hope is going to come alive. There's pain and suffering and sin. It pulls us down. It darkens our lives. But hope lights up the world. Hope lifts us out of that despair. Hope gives us purpose. It is so powerful. Well, I hope you were encouraged uh, or blessed by the message today. If you were challenged, let me remind you that there is therefore now no condemnation because of what Jesus Christ has done. So our intent is never to condemn you, but to invite you into a new life because of what Jesus has done. If you want more information about that, please, please reach out to us. You can reach out to myself personally at Dustin at thisisconverged.com. And I would love to tell you more about what Jesus has done for you. If you want to join us in person, search any app store, uh, Converge Sacramento, and you'll find our app. It's a little 3C logo, or you can visit us at www.thisisconverged.com. Let me remind you that you matter, and thank you for being here and sticking around with us. I'm so glad to be here with you.